The spread is grave, exceeding 7,000 confirmed cases today. Medical response capacity is being rapidly exhausted. On Wednesday, South Korea recorded more new coronavirus infections than on any single day in the pandemic. The healthcare system has been pushed to its limit, just as in many parts of the world. Exhausted staff, too few beds, equipment shortages. What can be done to strengthen healthcare systems and how best to prepare for the next wave? I'm Ben Fazul and welcome. Well, the big question is whether the damage to healthcare systems is permanent. Because if you do get sick at some stage, maybe not now, but later in life, who's going to look after you? Nurses and doctors are worked to the limit right now. Many are leaving their profession. And who can blame them, especially with a vaccine around that not everyone wants to take? Yulia Butcher has been a nurse here for seven years. She works at the F2 intensive care unit at Berlin's UKB trauma center. Instead of treating accident victims, her station is filled exclusively with COVID-19 patients. And each time, she puts on a protective suit, gloves, and so on. The works. Treating coronavirus patients is especially challenging and stressful, both physically and mentally. I have to be proactive with the patient. And sometimes I also say, I don't know if we'll see each other again. These are things that you take home with you. You can't just work eight hours and then go home and shut off. Now, during the coronavirus pandemic, you're permanently confronted with it, also privately, and you take some of it home with you. Frustration at the unit is rising among both nurses and doctors. Almost none of the severely ill patients have been vaccinated. We're seeing that 20 percent of our intensive care capacity is occupied by patients who for the most part wouldn't be here if they had been vaccinated. It's frustrating. About 5,000 COVID-19 patients are being treated in Germany's intensive care units right now. That means about every fifth ICU bed is occupied by a coronavirus patient. And as a result, planned operations must be postponed. Senior physician Hans-Joachim Janssen is convinced that without a vaccine mandate, as the government is currently discussing, the problem cannot be tackled. There is simply a difference between having a vaccination rate of about 70 percent or one of more than 85 percent. It has a massive effect on infection activity, and getting to that point is very difficult. We won't make it otherwise this winter. It would affect us again next summer and autumn. That's why I'm for a vaccine mandate. Every COVID patient receives these medications, and more, every day. Those who don't want to get vaccinated say these medical professionals should keep that reality in mind. And let's pick up on that last point with Martin McKee, Director of Research Policy at the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies. He joins us from London. What are the consequences of this pandemic of the unvaccinated on healthcare systems? Well, the consequences are really for three groups of people. Obviously, those people who are infected with COVID themselves, not just that they will get ill and they risk dying, but also whenever uh, hospitals are overwhelmed, then the ability to provide care for them is compromised. The second group are for the people who have other conditions, cancer, for example, or are awaiting transplants, and they cannot get the intensive care that they will need, so their operations are being postponed. And in some cases, that could be fatal. It could mean losing an organ that they would otherwise receive. And the third group that you've just heard from are the staff who are not just suffering from burnout, but also from a new phenomenon that we've more traditionally associated with the armed forces that we call moral injury. And that's the sense that we've just heard it described there of where health workers want to provide the best quality care, but they simply cannot because of the overwhelming workload that they face. And that has major implications for their mental well-being. What's the solution for that, for that last point that you make? Well, 
Within Europe, we see enormous differences in capacity in hospitals. Germany is very fortunate in this. It has uh, several times more intensive care unit beds than, for example, the United Kingdom. But generally, what we have seen is that countries that have done better are the ones that they can, ex that can expand into existing capacity. Now, that's not just having beds and hospitals. The crucial limiting factor is the number of staff. A number of countries, like the United Kingdom, set up these uh, hospitals, field hospitals and conference centres, but were not able to use them because they didn't have the staff. But the other crucial area is uh, the issue is the ability to redeploy staff and to bring in other people to help with the work, what we call task shifting. And where that's been able to be done, that's been able to help quite a lot. We keep hearing about better pay for doctors and nurses, which would be great, but it's not going to solve everything, is it, by uh, what you're saying? Well, we need to be careful with that argument because in many countries we don't pay health workers enough and uh, they recognise that they're undervalued. Now, if we look to the eastern part of the European Union, we see that often you have informal payments which compensates to some extent, but that's not the way we want to go forward. But we also, I think, really need to look at working conditions. It's the way in which we value staff in healthcare facilities, whether they can get hot meals in the middle of the night, for example, if they have somewhere to rest. So all of those things about making sure that people do actually feel valued and they have some support when they need it. Uh, there is quite a lot that has been learned from that. I sit on the European Commission's expert panel on investing in health, and we've just published a report which looks at the evidence on all of the things that can be done to support health workers in these circumstances. So how much more does need to be invested in health? Well, some countries are, have health systems that are already quite well resourced. Germany, France, for example. Others clearly need to spend quite a bit more. But it's not just how much money. You do need to have, in many countries, more money than particularly with an ageing population. Uh, an ageing population with complex uh, chronic diseases, multiple chronic diseases, and that's going to put upward pressure on health systems everywhere. But it is very much about how you spend it as well. And we do need to look at the models of care that we have after the pandemic. We need to look much more at team working. I know that there are debates in Germany about healthcare reform going forward. That's true in many countries. And how do we deal with the challenges of this changing population when we will have fewer, fewer young people, and that means fewer health workers, but more older people with the multiple conditions? Martin, from what you're saying, it all sounds like permanent damage to healthcare systems. In many countries, it's going to take a very long time to recover from all of this because we have, as you've heard, had an, a lot, quite a few staff who are saying, do I really want to be doing this for the rest of my life? They're getting perhaps to their 50s and they're feeling that they're completely exhausted and they're leaving. And in many countries in Europe, the healthcare workforce has itself been aging. So we have a, a major challenge there. But yes, I think we're going to have to start looking at ways of doing things. And in particular, the way in which we share out the different roles between different types of health workers, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, therapists and others, but also between health workers and patients and their carers, and also look at increasing use of technology. Because, of course, now many people, people will have uh, almost a, a mini laboratory at home if they've got a chronic disease. They can check their ECG, they can check their blood sugars, all sorts of things. And uh, so we're seeing the way in which technology can help in all of that. But it all needs to be put together in a comprehensive package. There's no magic solution here. You heard it from Martin McKee, the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies. Thank you very much for being on the show today. Thank you. Well, here's a question on Omicron now from one of our viewers. And here's Derek Williams. Will vaccines protect people against the new Omicron variant? We don't know yet, but it's certainly possible that the variant will be able to evade immunity to some extent. Some experts even think that it's likely. Let's look for a minute at why. Um, Omicron has around 30 mutations that could affect the structure of its spikes, those those protein clusters dotting its exterior that the virus uses to break into cells, which it has to do in order to start replicating. The spikes are also the home end target for the antibodies created 
when the immune system responds to a lot of the vaccines that we've developed. If the spike therefore changes a lot, or so the theory, then the vaccine-induced antibodies that are built to recognize the old version of the protein, they might not do that any longer. Now, antibodies are just one component of the immune system. There are others that could help make up um, for any lost ground. And booster shots could also help relativize any vaccine resistance. Still, a lot of scientists are worried that vaccine-based immunity could prove weaker for Omicron. Some indicators from South Africa back that idea up. For example, um, the speed at which the new variant is spreading there. It's moving pretty fast and infecting lots of people, um, even though a significant fraction of the population should have some immunity due to either vaccination or previous infection. So experts are saying both breakthrough infections and reinfections are probably occurring at a faster rate than with most previously seen variants. But it's also not really possible at the moment to make predictions about how Omicron might affect other countries. For example, uh, those with older populations or higher vaccination rates or lower numbers of natural infections. At this point, the biggest hope that healthcare officials everywhere have is that vaccines will at least continue to mostly protect recipients from severe disease caused by Omicron, as they do with other variants. But there isn't really enough data yet um, to call that more than a hope.